very much. Let's make it play and then excuse the gentleman. Thank you. Now we need the lights back on. <laughs> now we need the lights back on. Creative director. <laughs> I had open my mouth. Yeah, well, you did. Boom. Oh, you're so That's good. That's good. Thank you very, it's, very much for all your help. It's homey. It's homey. It's good. Green button. Green button. Huh? <clears throat> yeah, Max. Green button. Green button. There you go. And uh, play. Take it away, no, it's not going to play. There's, there's slides. Uh, everyone, thank you for coming and uh, for putting through with our technical difficulties. Uh, my name is George Gustinas. I write about comics for the New York Times, and I was very honored to uh, be asked to moderate uh, this panel. Uh, I'm going to introduce uh, the gentleman that you see before you. Uh, first, there is Neil Adams, who I'm sure all of you are familiar with. He's been uh, working in the comics field for decades, working on Batman. He helped transform him from the campy uh, jokester that he was for a while to the grim, dark knight that we have today. Um, I think even more important, he's been a champion for creator rights, uh, and I think he should be applauded for that as well. Yeah. Our second panelist is Craig Yo, and I'm going to quote this because I love this quote here. Uh, an award-winning historian of comics and cartoons has authored or edited more than 100 books in the field. That's amazing. Congratulations. There are not 100 good books, but there are 100. I go for qual quantity, not quality. <laughs> Before you go on, Craig Yo also is doing a series of books for uh, third world countries that are teaching children, and you may find this a very odd thing, to wash their hands. Yep. Uh, which is something that kills children all across the world because they don't wash their hands and they become infected and of course they die. Mm -hmm. And so he's doing a series of books with other organizations. I can't name them because I didn't memorize any speech about this, <laughs> but he's saving children's lives by the hundreds of thousands because of these comic books. Vice Magazine called him the Indiana Jones of comic historians. That's also great. Uh, our third panelist is Raphael Medoff, uh, the author of 19 books about the Holocaust and Jewish history, and the founding director of the David Wyman Institute for Holocaust Studies in D.C. Uh, he's written a number of, um, excuse me, <coughs> uh, educational comic books about the Holocaust, uh, and he and Neil have collaborated on Disney's educational division on a series of animated shorts about Americans who spoke out about the Holocaust. Thank you guys all for coming today. Finally, a little additional, uh, a little additional thing about Rafi. Rafi is a comic book fan. A dirty, rotten comic book. <laughs> Uh, let's he's, he's president of the Neil Adams fan. Whoa, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's how dirty and rotten he is. Dirty and rotten he is. That's right. 
Uh, so tell me, guys, uh, how did you come about this project together? What, what drew you to it? Um, who was, what was the catalyst for all this? Name a name. Who first? Oh, you, sir, Mr. Adams. You first, sir, Mr. Adams. Okay. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, I was uh, stationed in uh, Germany. I know, I was a kid. No, I was 10 years old. I was part of the Army of Occupation. My father was stationed in Germany, and, uh, and we were there as part of the Army of Occupation. I got to watch the American Army Corps of Engineers build Germany from nothing. Uh, res resurrect Germany and turn it into a place where people could live and people could be wonderful and happy and restart their lives and restart the country. I got to see it firsthand and I thought it was wonderful. I didn't know about the Holocaust except for a short period of time near the end of my time there when the army showed us kids these films of the Holocaust, of what was going on and they showed us too many and I couldn't speak to my mother for a week. Then we came back to the United States and I started reading comic books produced in the United States. I read comic books overseas, uh, but I got to read comic books with people I was gonna to go to high school with or going to, certainly going to junior high school with and we got to talk and we got to talk about comic books and comic books didn't seem to have to do with much of anything but comic books and then one day EC Comics turned out a book uh, that has, um, uh, has a story in it. That's the first story in this book. It's called there it is. Master Race. Yeah. Master Race. It's called Master Race. Uh, it was drawn by Bernard Craigsby, probably one of the greatest artists in comic books, who was treated so badly by comic books that he turned his back on comic books, became a teacher at the School of Art and Design, and insisted to everybody that he spoke to that he was not, he was a fine artist, and not a comic book artist. That's how badly he was treated. Yet, he turned that out. And as a kid, as a teenager now, me and my friends, my friends and I, were stunned by the story. We didn't know what was going on. I mean, this didn't tell us everything, but it made us investigate. And through this story, by Craigstein and Fel Feldstein wrote it, I guess, mm -hmm. um, in new graphic ways of telling stories, uh, repeated pictures in single panels, we got to see new kinds of storytelling, and yet at the same time, we started to hear about the Holocaust in comic books. <laughs> I know, it's weird, it's in comic books. We should have heard about it elsewhere. And I suppose, you know, I don't know, the adults were talking about it, but it didn't seem they were talking very much about it. The thing about comics are, Comic books, when it comes to comic books, nobody gives a crap. You know what I mean? Nobody pays attention, except for the kids and for the young adults who read the comic books and see new things. And we present new things in a way and in a form and with a sincerity that nobody else does it. Because we, one, we care. Two, nobody's watching us. Nobody. I don't know what it is about comic books that nobody pays any attention, but as soon as, if you had a children's book that talked about the Holocaust, suddenly people would be in an uproar. If you had a book, it would, everybody would be in an uproar. In comic books, nobody cared. Yet we were learning about the Holocaust through comic books. It was an underground, stupid way to find out about the, about the Holocaust. And so we learned, and it spread. And our generation grew up, my generation grew up knowing about the Holocaust. And, and I, I can tell you that these stories in this book are not all about the Holocaust. One of them is about Rommel. Many of them uh, crash into the Holocaust and veer away. But these are the stories that the comic book writers and creators did, drew, wrote about what happened during that period of time where it just seemed like people weren't talking about it. So there was no major contribution. There was no revolutionary day. But my generation grew up knowing about the Holocaust because of comic books, because we read comic books. And so we knew more than most of the kids around us. We could talk about it. We could talk to our friends about, you know what went on in Germany? This Terrible, terrible thing. And, well, I, my dad was sort of talking about it, but didn't really talk about it. 
And then slowly we learn more and more about it. Public television showed us some things, the newsreel showed us some things, and we got to hear about the Holocaust. And the one, one of the things that I came away with, and it's one of the reasons why I, ha I have a striking relationship with Raphael Medoff, is that the whole point of the whole thing is that we shouldn't forget. It could happen again, and we don't want it to happen again. So this book is a remembrance. This book is a creative statement. This book is what we did in comic books about what happened. And this is the only book, by the way. There's not going to be a second book. There's no volume two, because it's history now. There's no better stories. We picked the best stories. And we got the cooperation of DC, EC, Marvel Comics. We got the cooperation of everybody. They didn't penalize us, they gave us the stuff basically for free. And they let us do it because they felt what we were doing was worthwhile. And that's why we did this book. If anybody in this country should buy a comic book, it should be this one. It's my opinion. If I could just add one short um, comment. Did you say short? <laughs> I'm going to try yeah, to keep it brief. Say short. You say short. And your add a short comment. I was a I was a comic book fan um, as a teenager long before I became a, a stuffy Holocaust historian. And um, when I was a comic book fan as a teenager in the 1970s, there was a certain um, not exactly a stigma, but people tended to look down their noses at comic books and comic book readers. We hadn't, you know, comic books hadn't made it to Hollywood yet, not in a serious way. Um, and hadn't become a part of the mainstream culture the way they are today. And they were considered, I guess, just a kind of a cheap form of entertainment for adolescents. But my friends and I knew that, in fact, there was some extraordinary, groundbreaking, social justice commentary going on in comic books in the 1970s because we were reading comic books like the one that the image we have up there the green lantern green arrow series from 1970 71 that neil adams drew and which and which dealt with issues like racism and poverty and the environment uh overpopulation and other cutting edge issues which 14 and 15 year olds didn't know a lot about. But if you're reading comic books, and that was the great irony, if you're reading comic books, especially, especially the ones that were brought to life by the powerful, realistic illustration of Neil Adams, then you were learning about these kinds of issues. And so um, I want to tip my hat, Neil's gonna say tip your yarmulke, to, <laughs> to the comics industry he for- even pronounce it correct. <laughs> for being really ahead of the curve. Um, and for exposing um, young people especially to topics that ordinarily you, we would not have been learning about, I don't think, in ninth grade and 10th grade and so forth. The fact that comic books also taught about the Holocaust was not something that I realized until much later. But I just did want to, um, to mention that because um, the Green Lantern, Green Arrow series in particular, but there were others, of course, also, the famous, the Spider-Man drug issues and some of the others. Um, but they were really a uh, cutting edge kind of education for young people uh, in a form that young people enjoyed because, because we all like picking up a comic book. Uh, Craig, maybe you can answer this. Um, you, you have obviously done a lot of uh, comics aimed at children, but do you think uh, comics are an effective tool for adults as well to learn about uh, these topics? Uh, I, I, uh, I got into comics really early last I mean maybe maybe many in the audience did too but I, I was like eight years old when my mom got me a subscription to Walt Disney's comics and stories and the other uh, I mean last night I pulled out uh, the, the first comic book that came in the mail and I was so excited to run in the mailbox and, but I pulled it out of the attic last night to, to, to read it to my eight-year-old kid and uh, so it's, you know, it comes around, goes around. And so he's reading the very same issue that it, of the first comic book that I got, the actual physical copy. I was showing him 
probably how there's a crease down the middle where they <laughs> fold it in half to put it in the mailbox. I, lo I love that crease. <laughs> uh, and uh, he's learning to read from comics because it's, it's such an accessible medium. It's such a great medium for to learn and, and to enjoy because it's an integration of words and pictures in a, in a, in a colorful, printed colorfully and uh, you know, and drawn enthusiastically, and, and it's just a great medium to fall into for entertainment, but also to, can, it can be used to educate. And uh, I, I think uh, there used to be actually a lot of educational comic books. When, 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 when industry and educators realized that comics was a great, uh, up uh, was a popular form with kids, mostly because they learned that because of the criticism of comics in the 50s. They realized, that they seized, seized that as an opportunity and started creating all kinds of educational comic books that were passed out in schools. When I was in school, I got a comic book on fire prevention. And the other day, uh, my, my uh, five-year-old came home from kindergarten with a whole packet of things from uh, the local fire department, all kinds of pamphlets and things. But I was so sad that it didn't have a comic book. Cause I, and to me, this is a missed opportunity because comic books can so co effectively communicate. And so I love entertaining comics. I love Donald Duck and, and Uncle Scrooge and Little Lulu. But I love the fact that comics can speak to more serious issues. And uh, I married an Italian. And I, in our first year as a marriage, I was so surprised at how much she talked about politics because in our country it wasn't polite to talk about politics and, 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 and I was even maybe more apolitical than, than most that period of my life. But uh, in Italy, that, that's you know normal conversation at the beauty parlor and the barber shop and, and work and every place else. But, but we weren't engaged so much with politics, but now we are uh, for for various reasons, we're all we're we're like Italians, not just in the good pasta way, but also in the politic way that we we're engaged by politics. George had to take out uh, kindly take out uh, some time from his busy schedule of, uh, of uh, exposing uh, politicians for their financial and sexual misdeeds <laughs> at the New York Times to, to come and join us here today. Thank you, George. Comments are always first. You're doing, you're, doing, you're doing good work. Keep it up. Uh, but now, I think more than ever, uh, th this book kind of looks back, and I think there's other comics that can be done currently. That be, and, and, and why, sadly, this book is actually, uh, we just talked to, uh, Yo Books is a is an imprint of IDW. We just talked with the uh, the guy that that is my coordinator there uh, for Yo Books, and he was just saying this. He thinks this is one of our best books, and is do, doing uh, one of the best books out of the hundred that we've done uh, as, as far as getting out there and having people read it and stuff like that. And I think it's because of our time. It's sadly relevant. It's sadly contemporary. It's it's sadly uh, striking a reason responsive chord. I mean, uh, who would have believed we were, we, here in America, we would put kids in, uh, you know, from, uh, of different colored skin than maybe the people in charge, we, we'd put them in cages and separate them from their family and put them in cages, you know. So I think that uh, comics uh, can be one of the many ways we can, we can speak out we spoke out, but I hope we, I hope we're inspired by the speaking out that Neil and his contemporaries the back that did these. These comics go from the 50s to the 60s, so it was a span of time. But I hope, I hope we can uh, get excited to and, and passionate to speak out now against social injustices, so that never again. I like how you dance gently past that Donald Trump thing, <laughs> separating <laughs> the kids from their parents. So, I wasn't so going to mention any names. No, I know. You, Donald, what? Who? What? Uh, when we talk about, uh, when we talk about, uh, look at, let's, you guys mind being in the, in the nitty gritty here? You mind? Go ahead, Neil. Let her Okay, okay, okay let you know. Run. When we talk about, when we talk about, about things like this subject about, about, uh, 
but it could happen here. It could happen here, excuse me. We're trying to avoid it happening here right now, right now. People, I know people who are scared poopless about what's going on in this country. There's some bad stuff going on in this country. And we need people to fight against it and to do, do something about it. And this if, this, if there's no better reminder of that than this book, let me just tell you, that's all we got. Because there's not a lot being done by a lot of people. I don't know why, for example, the newscasters who make uh, uh, $2 million a year uh, as a salary don't get together and say, hey, we don't mind paying the taxes. We're fine. Let's join an organization to pay the taxes. And guess what? We're going to get on some trucks and we're going to re rescue those kids. Because there's oh, nearly, uh, what, there's over 140 kids still unseparated from their parents, are separated from their parents. And 12,000 kids that, are, are, that came over by themselves. We're in, we're in deep poop here. They're moving them in the dead of night. Yeah, there's, there's crap going on. I'm sorry about it, I didn't mean that. There's stuff going on. So there's, we have to be alert. We have to be uh, better than we are. Now, just let me uh, tell you about a few things that you may or may not know. The United States government, I'm not, this is not an anti-government thing. I've got nothing against the United States government in its normal form. <laughs> Changing. Uh, we, if, when we go to South America and we try to I institute policies in South America, we send comic books. <laughs> we do. We send comic books down there by the millions and we hand them out to kids and to people. That's what we do. That's part of American policy. Why? Because, I don't know, American government thinks that, uh, that people in South America are a little too ignorant to reg read regular books, so they send them comic books. Sort of like GIs, you know, we send GIs comic books because, man, they don't read real books, they read comic books. Let me tell you, they do read comic books. All GIs read comic books. More comic books were sent by American companies to GIs than to anywhere else. And I grew up in PXs and I could buy my comic books in the PXs along with everybody else. My father said, hey, you know, why are you reading those comic books? I go to bed at night, he'd come into my room and take my comic books out of the boxes, go read them and then put them back in the box. <laughs> Because soldiers love comic books. People love comic books. People love to read comic books. I don't think there's any medium in the world that's more read than comic books. You read it, you pick up a book, you know, and you look at it, and there's you know not much. Going, maybe one person read this book. I can tell by looking at it. Two or maybe two people read this book. Comic book. Fifty people read this comic book, or one guy read it over fifty times. <laughs> comic books are read. In advertising, they have what's called the Starch Reports, and the Starch Reports, and they have another th organization too, but the Starch Reports, they do this. They will tell you in your magazine what gets read the most, what is comprehended the most, what is, under, what is understood the most, what is gone over the most, and they will, all those other values that they need to know, and nothing is more read or comprehended more or read thoroughly more than comic ads, comic book ads. Balloon, you see balloons, people uh, got to read it. I did a thing called coffee bags when I was doing advertising comic books. Coffee bags, Maxwell House did coffee bags. The most read ad in the country was coffee bags. You take like coffee in a tea bag and put it in the coffee and get a cup of coffee. Cool, okay, it was a comic book ad and it went number one in the Starch Reports in the magazines across the country, okay. So comic books are read by people. We are too damn humble about our comic books. <laughs> I gotta tell you, people love comic books. We are making all our best movies with comic books, all our best television, all our best uh, computer games. You know, make computer games out of you know birds and all the rest of it. Suddenly, you're making co uh, computer games out of uh, DC and Marvel characters. They're bought by 10 times as many. I got a royalty check from DC Comics for one month, your first month of a, of a computer game, I never even saw for $165,000. For my little tiny royalty, and it's a little tiny royalty. They, comic books are doing fantastically well. It's a great, fantastic medium. We educate ourselves. I never saw a kid, okay, use his own money to buy a children's book. <laughs> you, ever, you ever see that? I want to buy, you know, whatever the children's book is. You know, buy I never saw it. Pull money out of your pocket. Some kid pull his money out of his pocket and, he, and, and read the children's book. Didn't happen. Never happens. They read comic books. They read comic books. They choose to. One of the most popular comic books in India is Archie. Archie Comics. 
this young man over here does books, comic books, so that kids will wash their hands and not die. That means so much to me. It should mean an awful lot to you too now that you've heard it. But comic books are an incredible medium. An incredible medium. And we, don't, we underestimate it. We don't get it. America, the American government gets it. We send comic books to third world countries by the millions to convince them of some American policy. That's our top priority when it comes to promotion of uh, uh, politics, propaganda. Comic books. I just got a uh, email this morning before I ran off to the convention that from uh, Kenya that uh, the, the comic book on uh, Washington hands is incredibly popular there, but it's it's it the the hand washing comic book is in uh, uh, 23 languages and uh, in tw and it's in 24 countries and it's uh, we've distributed over 50 million comic books so far. Okay. I think every comic book artist that does comic books in America ought to donate a week's worth of drawn comic books to doing comic books on washing your hands. Get the Cuber boys to draw. <laughs> Cuber <laughs> boys? Get, get Neil Cuba. Adams. Yeah, no, Start with Neil Adams. I say everybody. Right here first. I say everybody. Put our best guy. You got, did you write down, down, I, I, Mr. Yeah. Reporter? We're on the record. So you're yeah, there we go. go. I'm there. Would I miss it? Not a bit. Yeah. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, uh, the reason that, it, it, and uh, let me just say this about Rafi, over down at the end of the table, he's a little quiet, okay? He's a comic book fan through and through, okay? He came to me with this thing, uh, who was 17 years old, she was in uh, Germany with her mother, and the Nazis were taking people away to Auschwitz, various, various camps. She didn't want to, she decided she would go with her mother to protect her because her mother was older. And she didn't want her to go off by herself. She had no idea she was going to a death camp. So she wanted to go with her mom. She was an art student. She had watched Snow White and the Seven Dwarves seven times. Went with her mom to Auschwitz and uh, discovered when she got there, of course, she was gonna die along with everybody else. And uh, the kids in the next barrack, they said, uh, can you come over since you're an art student and you draw, can you come over and draw some pictures on the wall to entertain the kids? Why? Because they were going to die. And she said, sure, because you know what? A little ounce of happiness is important. So she did. She drew Snow White and the Seven Dwarves on the walls of the barracks. And Mengele, the angel of death, heard about it. And he sent for her. And he decided that since she could paint and draw, even though she was 17 years old, she would paint gypsies for him and paint their skin color that he believed was inferior to white people and therefore they were subhuman. And so if she would paint them, he would be able to show the other Nazis that they were subhuman just because of a small change in their skin color. They should die more than other people. And she agreed if they wouldn't kill her mother and her. They lasted through the war. They lasted through the war and went on a death march and lasted through the death march. And they were released. She came to America with her mother and she went to California to work in the animation field. And she married the guy who animated Dopey for Walt Disney. <laughs> Art a guy named Art Babbitt, who was also a union organizer in the, in the Disney studios. They divorced later after having two girls, because it happens. And one day, the Auschwitz Museum in Poland called, and they said, you know, uh, we have these paintings here, we think they might be yours. Of course, it said Dina right at the bottom. <laughs> she went over to identify them and take them home. Surely they were hers, and she wanted to take them home, and they said, no, no, we're keeping them at the museum. She said, but they're mine. And they insisted, no, well, they're sort of theirs because, uh, I don't know, they made a deal. And she kind of made a deal to give them up on pain of death, on pain of her mother's death. And so some of us have been actually fighting for Dina Babbitt's paintings to go back to her. She's since died, and her daughters are waiting for her. 
And that man over there is fighting to bring him back. So over 10 years now, 15 years, we're fighting. We're going to get them back. Okay, that's the last story. So, uh, that, Neil and uh, Rafi created a story about the, that. Is the last story in the book? That's the last story in the book. So the reason that I brought the story of Dina Babbitt to Neil's attention was this: when I first learned that she was fighting to, to get back her original artwork, then a little bell went off in my in, in my head uh, from when I was 15 years old and remembered Neil Adams leading the struggle to convince the major comic book publishers to allow the artists to, ha to, to get their original art back. So precisely because I knew from back then that Neil was a champion of creator's rights, I thought, well, he's the man to go to. Now keep in mind, this was eight or 10 years ago. I had long since left my comic book days behind. Um, and so when I went to meet Neil, I mean, it was like going to meet you know, my, you know, he'd, he'd been my idol. He'd been my favorite comic book artist as a kid. And I went into his studio in Manhattan, you know, trembling as a typical fanboy, but now, you know, 52 years old or whatever it was. Um, but Neil, Neil could tell right away that I was, in fact, a comic book fan disguised as a historian. <laughs> but but, I, but I was, my instincts were right, because it was precisely Neil's um, keen sense of justice whether to get artists their original art back then, or to try to help Dina Babbitt get her original art in our own time. Okay, nothing um, is sloppy. Now. Stop the <laughs> was sloppy. something that, that he was willing to throw himself into. And from that, from that original meeting and conversation came the comic strip that is in this book. And then from the work on the comic strip came our, the discussions that eventually led us to the idea of doing a whole book about how the Holocaust has been represented but before books. that happened, but before that That's happened... That's my version anyway. Right. <laughs> uh, Disney got a hold of the story, and they made what's called an animatic from it. It's basically a film with voiceover. The story they, about Dina Babbitt. Dina Babbitt. They added the Dina Babbitt story in an animatic form to three of the movie releases that they were going to do on video that year, including The Boy in the Striped Pajamas, uh, and the yeah. di Diary of Anne Frank. Yeah, Diary of Anne Frank, and another one that I forget. That, that image is a still from the motion comics that Neil drew for yeah. Disney. And we, put the, we made that the uh, in papers of the book. And then Disney was stupid enough to pay us to do five more stories. <laughs> five? <laughs> so we did five more stories for the educational system of diff different people who fought back uh, during, the, uh, um, during the war and fought back against Germany, including Mayor, Mayor LaGuardia of New York, who was a staunch anti-Nazi. So there were people, the, 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 the impression that Jews just marched off to the slaughterhouse is not true. People fought back in a big way, and many people. So Rafi has uh, recorded these stories. So we did five of our, I guess, our favorite stories uh, as videos, which are appearing in, the, in various school systems across the country. And we're hoping that Disney will do some more. We're hoping maybe there'll be a TV show on it. I, in fact, I spoke to a producer the other day who wants to get a hold of you, Rafi. Uh, and that might be good. That might be good. Anything that, anything that does what we need to do as human beings to see that this never happens again. It's really what it's all about. I mean, I never would have gotten involved with Rafi. He talks too slow. <laughs> And be, but he's, he's on the right side. He's on the side of justice and right. It's got nothing to do with me, in all honesty. I'm just a helper. Uh, Rafi's the guy that's uh, carrying the torch. And the torch is, part of the torch is those sit videos. And you should try to get to see them. They're on the internet. You can hear about them. Part of it is this book. Because he pointed out to me, and I agreed with him, because when he said there were American comic book artists and writers that wrote about this and drew about this. And I said, yeah, you know, that's right. I remember that first story by Bernie Craigstein. It so affected my life that it made me ask more questions, which is the most important thing you can do. So that Craigstein story touches a spark, and it's the first story in this book. And it's revolutionary. And in its own way, because it sort of 
resulted in Bernie Craigstein turning his back on the comic book industry. Whatever legacy he left behind, it was a great legacy. And it's in here. George, did you have any questions? Uh, yeah, George. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, I, you're so eloquent. I just wanted to let you, uh, you don't even need me up here. Um, this, the stories in the book are from the 50s and 60s, uh, Raphael. Were there, were there differences in how this, uh, the subject was presented over that time? Like, did they shy away from anything, or did they just take it all head on? Well, one of the, inter one of the interesting things we discovered um, was that in the 19... The book proceeds chronologically. <clears throat> we're looking at comic strips that were published in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. And we chose that time period because that was before the Holocaust was widely discussed in schools or in the popular culture. It was before Schindler's List. It was before there was a Holocaust museum in Washington or any other Holocaust museums. So that's what we were looking at. How, how are comic books talking to, to, um, to their readers at a time when, when people were not really talking about the Holocaust at all? When we started with the stories in the 50s, we found an interesting... Um, an interesting contrast. There were some, such as the, uh, as the one that Neil has been alluding to, Master Race, where, they, where the uh, Jews are identified as Jews. And you see, for example, in this sample page, you see in, this, in the second panel, the victims are clearly identified as Jews. Uh, but there were other stories in the 50s, and here's another example, where they're clearly talking about Jews in concentration camps, but the word Jew does not appear anywhere in the story. This is an example, escape from Majdanek. Well, Majdanek was a well-known Nazi death camp, and the primary victims um, were Jews, but in the story, Jews do not appear as such. Now that, um, to answer George's question, that, that began to shift noticeably later on. Um, in, the, in the later stories that we have in the volume, as we get into the 60s and the 70s, um, then we start to find uh, the Holocaust portrayed in a, in a much more comprehensive way. The victims clearly identified. Um, and, and they start to appear in mainstream comic book superhero uh, stories. So for example, we have Captain America. Now we all, we all remember the, you know, the, the famous um, comic book cover scenes of Captain America punching Hitler. Or talking about comics in the 1940s, right? But they were, it was, it was a war. It was not a war about the Jews or for the Jews. It was, America was at war with Germany. So Captain America is punching Hitler. But you won't find in those 1940s comics any discussions about the Holocaust. In We Spoke Out, when we bring this story up to the 1970s, here we have Captain America actually busting into a, a Nazi concentration camp and rescuing Jews from the Nazis. So the story um, is told. Not, and, and I should add, you'll see in We Spoke Out, there are a number of stories from war comics. Um, so a number by Joe Kubert and other you know, well-known uh, illustrators of war-themed comics. And naturally, in comics that are talking about World War II, largely, there are, were going to be some stories about the Holocaust. Uh, but we also found stories in, um, in other, other mainstream comics, superhero comics like the X-Men, uh, by now, the whole backstory of Magneto uh, being an Auschwitz prisoner is well known, but in fact, the story began in this 1982 issue of X-Men, where we first encounter um, Magneto's background uh, in the Holocaust. There's a, there are several, um, there's a famous Batman story we spoke out, illustrated by Neil, Night of the Reaper, um, also which kind of head-on confronts the Holocaust in a way that was not done during the early period, during the 1950s. Uh, and, 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 and so in, in the section in the book in the 50s, we've got a mixture. We show you both kinds. We show you a couple of examples where even in the 50s, like Master Race, they were talking about it openly and clearly. And we show you a couple of examples where it was, it was more universalized. That's great. I know you have uh, the video to share with us, but we have a couple of minutes for audience questions if anybody has a, a question for these gentlemen. And there's a mic in the middle of the room, or we can or go back and forth. Hi. I'm curious. Have you guys ever heard of the Deutsche Zeitungsfilme? I'm sure Rafi's might have heard of it. Have you ever heard of the DZF, the Deutsche Zeitungsfilme? No. Please tell us more. 
It's the Nazi animation studio inspired by the Walt Disney. Oh, oh, yes, yes. Okay. Do you know what it was across from? <laughs> it was across from Dachau. The animators saw the crematorium smoke every day. Very interesting. And Robert Sherman, um, part of the Sherman Brother duo from Disney, he was actually one of the first to liberate Dachau, and so he was there. Hmm. It's just curious how familiar you are with, if any of you are familiar with that. No, but, but I'd like to speak to you about it afterwards. I'd like Good, because I'm one, the only U.S. expert on it. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Excellent. I'm sure. Hi, guys. Um, so you did say there will not be Next. a second book, but I'm curious if you, know, you will consider maybe um, dealing with the more modern you know, works, uh, the touch on the Holocaust very recently. We had Ari Fulman's and Friend graphic novel that I think should be translated to English these days. And even even before Vendetta, you know, stuff that are more, the style is different, the language is different, so would you consider at all maybe releasing another one to deal with the more modern works? Well, uh, we, we, uh, I can get that. Uh, we're not publishers. Just so you know. Wait a minute. I mean, wait, wait a minute. I am a publisher. Yes. Right. <laughs> and and wait a minute. I am a publisher. But I'm saying we're not publishers of this book. And yes, you are a publisher of the book. So I have to qualify that. Obviously, things in the future will be considered for the future. You know, I don't see any reason why this shouldn't lead to other books. Uh, when I said that there will be no second book, I'm talking about in the past. Uh, this, these, this is the work that has been done in the past. There are really, you know, any other stories were just, you know, Nazis fighting, you know, sexy women or something. I mean, I, uh, I think what well, Neil was, we're not, was saying, we, this, we this, this book is compre comprehensive for what, for what it set out to do to, to, to publish the best stories of, right. uh, about the Holocaust from the yeah. 50s, 60s, It would be great 80s. if it led to other books. I mean, it just yeah. seems to me that... We would know, love and, that. Yeah, that would be great. And, but, and, and, and by other certainly publishers. there are graphic novels and other publishers sure. and Art Spiegelman's exactly. books that have all certainly touched on, yeah. more than touched on the subject. And This is rather historical. So this is a historical look at, yeah. What, yeah. at what happened. And but we we, but, but Rafi and I are discussing a book right now uh, you can hold it up, Rob, if you got it. Uh, we're we're, we're going to do a, a, a book of, of political cartoons. And again, most political cartoons, it's interesting political cartoons, uh, because I, I study uh, radical cartoonists and activist cartoonists and communist cartoonists that were in the United States and, and even mainstream newspapers that were, were against uh, America involvement uh, in, in what was happening in the 40s, but you know, on Pearl Harbor, that the next day, all the newspapers that had been publishing cartoons that were, you know, against going into war, uh, suddenly every single newspaper in America became pro uh, American involvement and anti Nazi, but there were very few cartoons uh, about that really touched on the Holocaust. But uh, Rafi, uh, I, I found a few in my collection that there were, and Rafi found, a, through diligent research, found a whole bunch more. And so this is a, 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 a mock-up, a prototype. prototype of a book we're gonna be doing, Cartoonists Against the Holocaust, about the political cartoons. And it turns out there was great political cartoonists like Herb Block and Dr. Seuss uh, was a political cartoonist for a while, and he did, uh, of cartoons that touched on the Holocaust. So we will, we are working on that, right? That's excellent. Yeah. We have a question in front. Dr. Madoff. Yes. When I was growing up, there was a lot of Holocaust deniers that were outside the United States. I read recently where there are more and more people in our own country who not only don't know about the Holocaust, but those that do are minimizing it, denying it. Why do you suppose that's wormed its way into our culture the way it has. I think you might be referring to a poll that was taken a few months ago where um, it was reported that two-thirds of millennials did not know what Auschwitz was, completely unfamiliar with the term, right. um, and didn't, do, didn't know other very basic facts about the Holocaust. Now keep in mind, this is despite the fact 
that today in 35 out of our 50 states, Holocaust and genocide education is part of the curriculum. Either it's a matter of law or it's the policy of the board, boards of education, but it is taught in high schools in 35 states, and yet, clearly there are flaws in the, in the way it's being taught because it's not, something, something is not sticking. Um, Holocaust denial is a, is a kind of a weird form of anti-Semitism, and it's a complicated subject, and different countries deal with it in different ways. In Europe, in Germany, for example, it's been outlawed, um, and in other European countries as well. Here in the United States, you really can't outlaw any type of speech, so, it's, so it has to be handled differently, for example, through education. But obviously a lot more has to be done in terms of, 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 the, of, of the weapons we give, the educational weapons we give to teachers if we want you know, the next poll of millennial, of, of, you know, the next, the, of, of young people to, sh to, to produce better results. I think we have one more by the mic, and then we'll come back to the front. Thank you. Um, as people are continuing to uh, write uh, and do uh, write stories about and graphic novels about the Holocaust, what are some ways you think that they can improve upon what was written and illustrated in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, and what <coughs> are things that you think that they could add that were missing from them? Actually, what I'd like to see done is for the is for many of these comic strips to be used in classes as they are, not. Yeah, I don't think we need to create new ones. I think we have classic, high-quality material from a wide range of different types of comics, superhero, war comics, horror comics, um, which could be used very effectively in schools. And the, the political cartoons, to which Craig alluded a moment ago, also um, make for striking visuals to be used in classrooms. So I think both the comic book, the, the, the comic strips that the comic, you know, our comic book creators artists and writers have already created um, can, can and still uh, should be used because these are, um, you know, you know, comic books really never go out of style. Um, there have been many comic book stories published um, since, you know, in the period after the period covered in our book. That is, in the 1990s, in the 2000s, there have been Holocaust themes in comic strips. Um, and some of them are good and some of them are not so good. It's the same mixture. Um, they're not necessarily better because they're newer. Uh, frankly, if you, you know, if you, if you give me a Master Race or Knight of the Reaper by, by Neil Adams and, and Denny O'Neill, I would take that any day over, over some of the more recent comic strips. So it's just a matter of teachers, you know, sifting out the less effective from the more effective materials. But it's there. Mater the, 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 the materials are there. Sure. Uh, if you don't no. mind. Uh, Here's the problem. <laughs> Human beings like to be entertained. It's not a good trait. We should be able to quietly sit and study things that we either don't like or we need to study in order to know things. But the truth of the matter is the general population likes to be entertained. Um, and I feel part of Rafi's personality <coughs> that is the comic book fan, in some ways is the greater of the two, the scholar and the fan. That fan over there was responsible for getting me involved. That fan over there was responsible for this, getting this book together, was responsible for doing, we fought back those videos that we did. And those videos would make great television shows. There are stories of resistance in the, during the Holocaust that happened that aren't necessarily just people going off to their death. Because people going off to their death is too heart-wrenching. I found that out when I was a kid. It's just too terrible to be able to see. But to see Mayor LaGuardia fight against Nazis, to see a guy dress up as a woman, and to pretend to marry people, to take them across the border, uh, to let them escape from Nazi Germany, to, or to uh, have people do go on grape-picking excursions for vineyards and go across the Alps and to escape into the free world, uh, to get aboard ships and to leave Germany, uh, to go to Morocco and to forge papers, which my wife's uh, mother did, uh, forge paper for, papers for other people until she could earn enough money to make her own papers so that she could get out of Morocco, go to Canada, and then come to the United States. These are interesting stories. 
These are the stories that will appeal to us. These are the stories that need to be told. And these are the stories that will keep this stuff fresh in our minds. Just like Rachel Maddow keeps the news fresh in our minds mm -hmm. at night when stuff is flying everywhere. I mean, and, they, and the New York Times. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. We try. We, 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 need the, we need it fed to us like Schindler's List in a form of entertainment so that we can hear these stories because we cannot take the terrible tragedy of the Holocaust full bore, unmitigated, un, un calmed down by some aspects of storytelling because it's too terrible. It's unbelievable to think about it. But we can think about it a few steps back and then seeing stories about individuals. That's why uh, these individual stories seem to work. So I think we need to actually get the entertainment business at comic book companies, uh, book companies, uh, graphic novels, uh, movies, television shows, to do more of this stuff so that we can see it for what it is without having to put, you know, to deal with that terrible... I, okay, let me tell you this. <laughs> I watched three hours of the film of the, of the camp when I was a kid. I think the army was testing us in Germany when I was a kid. And they showed us three hours. And it's, it hurt. It hurt my life. It hurt my life. You can't just watch this stuff. You had people who were, who were celebrating the American army coming into these camps who people were standing and walking and the doctors knew that those people would die because their bodies were already dead and they were celebrating being released. These things are too hard. You, you can't do that. It's too much. You have, to, you have to tell better, lighter stories that still allude to it, that still talk about it, but still entertain you with stories. And those stories are out there. And the thing about Rafi is that, you know, when, I, when we first talked about doing these five or six stories, whatever it was, five stories, I thought, well, I'm just going to hear terrible stories. And they weren't. They were uplifting. They were wonderful stories in a weird kind of way. Uh, they, were, they were tragic, but still interesting. They were dramatic and powerful. These are powerful stories. And these stories are the stories that need to be told. And so we need to find people in the media that will help to tell these stories, because this thing has to continue to be told, not just for Jews, for the rest of us, for those 400 kids that are separated from their parents. We, we can't see this go on for that guy who, uh, for that judge, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to say it. I cannot uh, contemplate that person being on the court. I can't contemplate it. To me, that's a story. And we need to hook these things together. And we need to tell these stories. We cannot be too scholarly. We have to be, you know, I have to say it, entertaining. We have to entertain. And that's our job, by the way. That's our job. That's what we do. That's what he does with washing your hands. I think we have time for one more question. And the gentleman by the mic has been waiting. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so we saw that, as you are saying, before Pearl Harbor, there was very there were like there were very few anti-Nazi films like um, Charlie Chaplin and Three Stooges were like really the only ones some of the only ones that were making those and part of that was that even though there were a lot of Jewish people in Hollywood people were self-censoring because they didn't want to see, be seen as like just trying to defend the Jews or getting America into another European war was that same thing happening in the comic book world or the, were the pressures that kept people from telling these stories coming from the artist or coming from someone above or you know coming from higher up saying don't tell these stories in the beginning in the beginning no in the beginning uh like i said nobody cared <laughs> nobody cared about comic book people if you if you went to your editor and you had a story about nazis and about the holocaust if it was a good story he let you tell it a little bit later on there was a little bit of censorship going on suddenly you didn't hear the word jew mm. uh there was you know a little pressure put on i don't think the pressure came from uh from so, you know, there's a lot of people that have what's called self, what you call self paranoia. They're afraid that something's going to happen, so they don't do it, and it's not going to happen. It's BS. 
I, I can tell. I'm going to tell you something. You know, and this is just part of a real part of real life. I have a I have a studio in New York. I have a home in New York. I have a loft. Okay, my loft and my phone is in the phone book. My home phone number is in the phone book. My address is on my website. Anybody who wants to call my home can call it. There's no block calls, nothing like that. You can call it. You're not gonna. <laughs> I'm just saying. You're not gonna because you're people. You know, you're not some crazy person that I and my stupid imagination to think is gonna call me every 15 minutes. You're not gonna do it because people are people. So every six months I'll get a phone call and it'll be some teenager and he'll go, uh, hi, is this Mr. Adams? And I'll go, yeah, who'd you call? I say, uh, the Neil Adams, the comic book guy? I say, well, who do you think you called? Yeah, this is Neil Adams. Oh, fuck, it's Neil Adams! <laughs> Hangs up the phone. He's obviously there with three or four other guys, and they're, you know, like, well, could it really be Neil Adams? I'm sorry I called you, Neil. I don't know why you keep bringing this up in public. Just saying, I'm just saying that there's, this, there's a paranoia that takes over that people think are, bad things are going to happen. They're not going to happen. It's all BS. So these, this, that kind of thing of taking Jews out of the comic book, it's, it's, it's stupid, but innocent stupidity. They're just like, something, somebody might say something. No, nobody's going to say anything. That's just the way it is. People don't. People are better than that. Immediately after this panel concludes, Neil, Craig, and I are going to be at Neil's booth, as you see, 2544. So we'll be happy to continue any of these, you know, discussing any of these topics, answering any questions for those who didn't have... Uh, we didn't have the opportunity to, to ask. We have, we have we'll be a, selling the book, of course, and signing. We have a few of the books at our booth, but uh, I am kind of hoping the idea. Yeah, if you will come to Neil's booth, I, that may yeah, be, we'll be there to sign. One of the yeah. few opportunities that we'll be together, since Neil won't talk to you anymore, since I call him in the middle of the night all the time. <laughs> uh, uh, it'll be one of the few times we're together that we could sign your book. It's a, it's a rare opportunity. It's a book we're very, very proud of, and uh, we thank you for coming today. We thank you, yeah, George. You thank you. George. you guys were a great audience. Thank you very much. Thanks, and, uh, thanks again. Take care. Okay.